October is more than half over with. Did you all realize that? Today is the 20th of October. This is the month in which we celebrate my wife's birthday all month. We do it all month long. We do. We do. So it's also week three of our stewardship series, The Prodigal. And today's sermon is going to be divided into, again, two noticeable parts. The first one's on stewardship. The second one is talking about the parable we commonly know as the prodigal son. Now, if you'll notice in the bulletin, uh, we were so excited about last week's title that we included it again in this week's bulletin. But if you came to hear about the rule breaker, you're going to hear about the rule follower. Good to know no one's perfect, isn't it? A steward, okay? A steward defined as one who cares for the affairs or resources of another. One who manages the affairs of the owner of a large estate. The large estate, as we talked about last week, is our world, our community. And the owner is God. Again, as Christians, we believe that God is the creator of our world and that He gifted it to humanity, to us. And we're supposed to care for it, right? As we think toward 2014, I know it's just around the corner, it's hard to believe, how many shopping days left till Christmas? Somebody knows. I know they do. Somebody knows. Okay. As we think ahead to 2014, um, there's a couple things that you need to know. Okay. One, our operating budget at Hillside United Methodist Church will increase by approximately $50,000. Why? A few primary reasons. Your trustees are wrestling with a lot of capital improvements. You've noticed doors getting replaced around here, making them more insulated and secure. You noticed hallways getting new floors in them. Well, now they're wrestling with what are we going to do with the flooring and the foyer? And then we've got an outdated phone and Internet communication system here at the church that needs to be upgraded. We need these capital improvement projects done. The second reason, Staff Paris Relations team determined that, that we need an additional full-time staff position. You know, someone to serve, better serve the needs of our congregation and, and, and resource the educational and the connectional ministries of our church. And these cost money. And your finance team and your board of directors, they approved the increases to this budget. Lastly, we're also increasing the amount that we pay toward the mortgage. Instead of making 12 monthly payments, we're going to make 26 bi-weekly payments of $5,500 each, hoping that we will knock months, no, we're going to knock years off of our mortgage. It's also important that you know that over the last three years, including this year, okay, your church leadership, Hillside's leadership, has effectively managed God's resources, spending only 85% of its proposed budget each year, or less, only 85%. Good stewardship. Why am I sharing these business-related details on Sunday morning? Because a couple weeks ago I pledged to you that we would continue to be good stewards of God's resources. And I pledged that, that we would remain transparent in our reporting practices. So you can pick up every week. There's a record of giving, a P&L back there in the back. All of these things are available to you. Many of you look at spreadsheets and go, oh, it's just a bunch of numbers to me. And that's okay. But it's back there if you would like to see it. Also because this is our primary gathering of God's people. And this is where we give back our resources to God and financially support the ministries of Hillside Church. A couple of last words about the budget. Don't give to support a budget. We don't give to support a budget. We give our tithes and offerings to God as an expression of our love and gratitude. That's why we give. That's why He gives to us. Because He loves us. We give to participate with God in His ministry to the world through Hillside United Methodist Church. We give to make a difference. And your participation matters. You matter. You matter in the ministry to the world through Hillside Church. 
through his prophet Malachi. Okay, God challenges his people. He says what? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me on this, he says. And see if I won't do what? Open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing that none of your barns will be able to contain it. Now many of you continue to give faithfully to God of your tithes and offerings, bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse. And I believe God has blessed your sacrifice because we now have a surplus. A reserve account, if you will, of both the general operating budget and of the mortgage. So if, for some reason, we should fall into a situation where we're a bit short. God has already provided the resources to make it up. To make a difference. Also, I believe He's blessed it because we were able to refinance our mortgage at a reduced rate, knocking years off of our repayment. That's management of God's resources. That is good stewardship. And both of these, I believe, support the biblical principle that if we bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, God will bless it. So that our barns are what? They're overflowing. So on the back of the sanctuary, many of you already picked it up because is your habit, you come in, you see stuff on the table, you pick it up. That's what we do. You'll see there's envelopes back there, much like our newsletters, with your names on them. They contain a letter, but then they also contain a very simple prodigal card because I think at one time or another all of us have been prodigal right hopefully we've been recklessly extravagant or spent everything if you don't find one see us we'll get it to you and guess what if you forget it we are going to be so kind as to mail it to you we are we are tomorrow we'll mail it to you tomorrow also there's blue cards back there so if you have children or grandchildren they can participate. As next week, we're going to bring our commitment cards back and we're going to celebrate. But they can participate. And it says things like, I will pray. I will come to church. I'll be kind to others. I'll follow the rules. Very simple. But it'll teach kids that, that stewardship is for all of us. And next Sunday, we're going to bring them cards. We're going to to consecrate them and pray over them and pray that God will bless our commitments of not only our money, but of our time and our talent and of our resources and of our participation. And so this week, you're going to be asked in the letter to pray about what percentage of your income God would have you give and then write it down. And you're going to be asked what percentage of my time, service, and participation would honor God in 2014 and then write it down. For many of you, I realize this is only an exercise reinforcing what you already do anyway, right? You already make a commitment to God, either in your heart or on paper. For others of us, this is a completely new thing, and it kind of scares us. What will happen if I'm unable to fulfill my commitment? Well, you're not going to get a call from your pastor, I can tell you that, saying, hey, what's going on here? God's more concerned, hopefully you've heard this, God is more concerned about the motive for which you give than He is about a dollar amount or a percentage. The purpose of giving is not so we can plan a budget. I'm telling you, we've already planned the budget. And if resources don't match up with spending, guess what? We're going to alter the course and we're going to spend less. We'll remain good stewards based on the actual giving. The purpose, okay, is so that through our giving, our serving, our living, and our participating, we can grow closer to God through this tangible commitment. Okay? Because He already has, as we talked about last week, He already has all the resources in the world at His disposal anyway. They're all His. What we give and what we keep. And our goal is not to have a big number to report to you. Our goal is so that we will grow closer to God by giving, by serving, by seeking, by loving, and by living. So next week, we're simply going to celebrate the extravagant love of the Father. That's what we're going to do. We're going to celebrate conveniently 
The sermon is titled, The Extravagant Love of the Father. That's what we'll celebrate. I hope you'll be a part of it. But this week, we're going to focus on elder brothers, okay? The extravagant rule follower, okay? Prodigal, recklessly extravagant, having spent everything. So we learned that this story, this parable, okay, Jesus tells it's the third in a series. The first one, lost sheep. The second, lost coin. The third, lost son. Three things are lost. We've learned that this parable is told for whom? For the benefit of those in the audience. And there's two distinct people groups that are present, right? One, the tax collectors, the teachers of the law, those inside the Jewish faith or the church. And then there are the sinners and the tax collectors, those who would be outside of the Jewish faith, outside of the church. Okay? We learned that these two people groups obviously live their lives in contrast to one another. They are what? Polar opposites. They're nothing alike. This story is not about one prodigal son, but rather it is about what? A father who had two sons. The younger son, as we know, what? Asked for his share of the estate... Basically ask the father to do what? Rip apart his life. Divide it among the two sons. He took it, left, squandered it, came to his senses, came home, and the father did what? Welcomed him home without restitution. And then, then he threw a party to celebrate because his lost son had come home. The older brother did what? He stayed to serve in the family business. We learned that these sons actually represent the two people groups, right? Those outside of the faith, the rule breakers, and those inside of the faith, the rule followers. And as we've all figured out by now, plainly obvious, the father, the father represents God in the story, right? So back to the older brother this week the extravagant rule follower, the one who stayed, okay? When the father divided his estate, okay, which only occurred at death, right? So the younger son had actually wished his father dead. When the father divided his estate, the youngest son got what? One-third of the father's wealth. The father sold off one-third of his property, one-third of his, of his livestock, one-third of his agricultural resources, one-third of his possessions, and gave them to the younger son. But the older son always got a double portion. So two-thirds of the estate now belong to the older brother. So follow me here. If the father gave away one-third of the estate, okay, the father gave away one-third of the estate, how much is left? Two-thirds, right. So in the parable, when the father goes out and pleads with the elder brother, telling him, everything I have is yours. He wasn't lying at all, was he? He was telling the entire truth because the entire estate now belonged to the elder brother. It's all the older brothers. Everything. So why did the elder son inherit a double portion? In every case in ancient times, the eldest son inherited a double portion of any of the rest of the children. Why? Because life centered around your property, okay? Around your family. If you owned property, you had wealth, okay? Older brothers were supposed to be the responsible ones. Anybody an older brother? Older sister? Who's the responsible one in the family? Anybody got a younger sibling? They responsible? Nope, we're not. <laughs> we may be someday, but we're free and loose. We live life to the fullest. Right here and right now is what's important to us, right? I'm having a good time. Woohoo! Younger brothers, right? The older brother is the responsible one. They received a double portion. Why? So that they could keep the family together. 
so that, because it's centered around your property, right? So that the family's estate could remain intact a long time after the patriarch's death. The elder son became the patriarch of the family at the father's death. Everything the family had was tied up in their land, their livestock, and their agriculture. And the estate supported the entire family group. And it was the responsibility of the eldest son to ensure that it did. So follow me here, okay? When the younger son left home, whose responsibility was it to go after the younger brother and bring him home? It was the older brother's responsibility. Don't you think that everyone listening as the story developed wondered why the older brother had not gone to chase the younger brother down and do what? Bring him home and restore the family. So did the elder brother fulfill his responsibility as the patriarch of the family? So what do you think was going through the audience's mind when they realized that the father represented God and the two sons represented the two people groups that are in the audience listening to the story. Now keep in mind, these are not common parables, okay? We think they're common stories. These were not common parables. This was the first time they had ever heard this parable. They'd not been told before. So yeah, there was kind of a reason why the Jewish ruling class begin to hate Jesus Christ. Because what he did was reveal their selfish motives for practicing their faith. So the elder brother does not go after his younger sibling, right? Like it or not, fair or not, older siblings are responsible for caring for and looking after younger siblings. Always have been, always will be. May not be fair, may not be just, but that's the way it is. Okay, so the younger brother does what? Comes home and is received back into the family without being required to pay restitution. Now keep in mind, the father never says that he will again divide his estate. Never says that. But he does restore his younger son into the family. And then he throws an elaborate and very expensive celebration. Throws a huge party for the entire village to come and celebrate. He says what? We must celebrate because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. This is a metaphor for salvation. Don't miss it, okay? Jesus talked about being born again, about being brought back to life. This is a metaphor for sal salvation. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. So, besides anger, what two things must be going through the elder brother's mind when he hears that his younger, son, younger brother has come home and there's a huge party? What's going through his mind? Number one, if my father has restored my younger brother into the family, will he once again divide his estate? Am I going to have to give up my stuff? Am I going to have to share with him? And notice, notice in the passage, whenever he talks to his father, okay, what's he say? He says, the father says, or the servant says, your brother has come and your father. The older brother became angry and refused, but he answered his father. He said, look, I've been slaving for you all these years, but when who? This son of yours. It's not his brother. He's this son of yours. Comes home. And the father says what? We had to celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He won't even acknowledge that his brother's in the same family with him. 
The other concern of him is what? Who's paying for the party? Who's paying for the party? If the entire estate, all two-thirds of the estate that are left, if it now belongs to the older brother, who's paying for the party? He is. He's footing the bill for the whole thing. Again, he couldn't give a rip about the father. And he could care less about his brother. All that he was concerned about was that his wealth was being spent on this son of his. He doesn't care about the father at all, does he? His motives, his heart are revealed. His motives are revealed when he refuses to join the family and celebrate. And he says what? He says what? Look, Dad, all these years I've slaved away for you and never once disobeyed you, and you never even gave me a young goat to celebrate with all my friends. So essentially what he's saying is, I've kept all your rules, Dad. I've slaved away making you money. It was all for you. I took care of your business. And what did it get me? You haven't shared any of your wealth with me. But the father's no dummy, is he? The elder brother's not a dummy either. They both knew that the eldest son stood to inherit everything. Okay? So all the older son was doing was what? Following all the rules to increase his own wealth. Because at his father's death, it was all him. His. All of his family resources belonged to the older brother. So it was not just the father's wealth. The older brother was only caring about what belonged to him. But the older son, what? He enjoyed all the luxuries and benefits of being the oldest son in a family and enjoying all of the benefits and the wonderful life that the father had provided. But he wanted no relationship with the father. He was only buying his time, hoping and praying what? That the father would die. Just like the younger son. He wished his father was dead. So there was a man who had two sons. And they both wished him dead. And they were both wrong. And they were both lost. They were in desperate need of being found. One tried to get the father's things by selfishly and bluntly asking for it and then breaking all the rules. And the other, the other did what? He tried to get the father's things by keeping all the rules and working. But his heart was never in it because he was selfish too. And he didn't care a thing about honoring his father. Two people groups are present. One keeps all the rules, thinks that they can earn their way into the kingdom of God. God owes them a blessing. Owes them their place at the great banquet. They deserve to be in the family of God. After all, they've done what? They've earned it. The other group present, they've broken all the rules and they can't believe that God would ever love them. They've let Him down so many times. They have dishonored God. How could He love them? But the Father does what? Loves both sons equally. Father loves them both. And the story ends without resolution, right? The younger son's restored to the family and is inside the party. Back in the family. The older brother is outside of the party. Refusing to do what? Refusing to be a part of the family. I'm going to quit talking about the story here because you all get it, right? We all get it. Okay, So church, at some point, we have moved, we are moving, or we will move from a wayward, disobedient younger brother who is lost and outside of the family of God to a member of the family of God with our eternal inheritance secured. We become the older brother. And it's our responsibility to do what? Go after our brothers and sisters and bring them home. And when they find their way home, we don't make them come begging and pleading for our forgiveness and acceptance. They don't owe us an apology because they have not sinned against us. 
And the Father has already done what? Freely offered His forgiveness, poured out His grace and mercy on them, and restored them as a child in the family of God. And we, the older brothers, were meant to celebrate and rejoice because our brother or sister was alive, or is alive. They were dead, and now they're alive again. That's why we give of our hard-earned resources so that the lost get found. We serve so that others can find their way home and we're supposed to seek out our younger brothers and sisters and bring them home to the Father. Our giving and our living, our serving and our loving are all responses to what? The extravagant love of the Father. We've experienced unconditional and undeserved love. Radical love which we did not and cannot earn. And we should have a burning desire for others to experience it too. Thanks be to God that He could love even a sinner like me. Amen.